Rohit. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Stealth. And today we are talking to Ravi Raj. Uh, Ravi Raj is currently a partner at Lightspeed Ventures Partners. Um, and he's originally from India, graduated from IIT Bombay, where he started two companies, Hello Intern and Book My Cab. Uh, both were acquired, so good exits. Uh, uh, then he went to Harvard Business School and he worked in product management at LinkedIn and Fundbox. Uh, now he's, he's a partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners, uh, where he invests in early and growth stage uh, enterprise and deep tech startups. He has invested in companies like Aurora, which is an autonomous vehicles company, Anyvision, which is a computer vision company that's trying to solve real world problems, and Fortress IQ, which is using AI for business process mining. And, and he's, he has a few investments in stuff that, that are going to come out soon. So, yeah. Welcome. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot for giving me the chance to speak to you and talk to your audience. Yeah. Totally. I'm, I'm super excited about this one. Yeah. Uh, for some of us, uh, some of our viewers who don't know about Lightspeed, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the... Absolutely. Part? Yeah. So Lightspeed is a global venture capital firm. We manage around $7 billion of capital around the world. Uh, we have teams and offices in China, India. In Israel, outside uh, the Bay Area, uh, we've been you know we back companies at various stages, various sectors, and across geographies. Uh, you know, we've been actually been supporters of a lot of immigrant founders. Mm. Uh, you know, we were the first kind of big institutional backer for Nutanix, which is a multi-billion dollar company started by Viraj Pandey. Uh, we were early investors in App Dynamics. Right. We were early investors in Zscaler. Uh, you know, we are early investors in Rubrik. A lot of these founders are all immigrant founders. So uh, we've, we've been very fortunate to work with a lot of exceptionally smart and driven immigrant founders that have created epic, uh, something once in a lifetime kind of companies. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, these companies are, multiple of these companies that you mentioned have IPO'd. They're in the public markets and doing really, really well. Uh, cool. Uh, and how long did you, how long ago did you join Lightspeed? So I've been at Lightspeed for more than two years now. Okay. I joined in January 2017, uh, and I focus on early stage, primarily early and growth stage enterprise. So that's seed and Series A primarily. Seed, Series A, Series B. So uh, I yeah. optimistically look at uh, later stage as well. Awesome. Um, so with that context, let's start with your background. Uh, so, uh, give us a sense of uh, where you grew up, okay. and and you also went to IIT. Okay. Uh, and where you started multiple companies. So we'd be really curious to to understand how you decided uh, to start companies at such an early uh, yeah. age, like in yeah. 2006. Yeah, something. yeah, yeah. So I actually was born and I brought up in Jabalpur, which is a city in central India. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. kind of like middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. For those who don't know India, it's kind of like, think of it as Nebraska of India, <laughs> which is like far from any big city. And yeah, I grew up there, finished all my schooling and went to ID Bombay. Mm-hmm. Uh, at ID Bombay, I studied engineering physics. So I was always very curious about cutting edge technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I spent a lot of time in the first year in IIT actually looking at robotics and, and, and sort of like new kind of like technological, uh, you know, innovations in various fields. And uh, it was amazing for me because coming from Jabalpur, I was not exposed to a lot of different things. And now at IIT, I had exposure to a lot of extremely smart and driven people, both students and professors, but at the same time, I had all the resources to actually try out and build things. And it was pretty amazing. Uh, IIT Bombay, fortunately, also had a very strong early kind of like entrepreneurial ecosystem. We had an institute called Science for Society for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. the U- U- Mashuala Innovation Center, and the Entrepreneurship Cell. So I got exposed to a lot of entrepreneurs through that. And to me, it felt like, you know, it, it was so amazing to see people actually building businesses that everyone in the country or a lot of people in the country use. Uh, so that's, that was like the motivation. It was like, hey, I need to do something like that. Uh, when I was actually looking for a summer internship in the second year, was a huge struggle for me and my classmates to find it. Hmm. And I was like, well, there is a job site like Nokri. Why right. can't there be a platform for people to find summer internships? Right. Uh, you know, I learned a lot about how summer internships are such a valuable part of the Western education system, but they weren't quite there in India. And a large part of that was because there was no bridge between companies and students. And that's what I wanted to do. So I, you know, teamed up with a couple of my classmates and started mm-hmm. HelloIntern.com. Uh, 
when I was in the second year in my uh, IIT Bombay uh, days, and it was amazing. Like I, I realized that sitting in my dorm, I was able to help students across the country find internships and actually lay the foundation of their career, which was extremely, extremely satisfying more than anything else. And, and, and I didn't start the company because I wanted to build a big business. I right. started a company because I wanted to solve a problem right. that me and my friends faced. Uh, and then it became something much larger. Uh, and that was very, very satisfying. And then I realized, it was at that, that point I realized that like technology has the ability to help you scale, help make a massive impact just beyond yourself. And and I at that point, I kind of decided that I want to pursue uh, ways to actually implement and expand it. That, that sort of businesses using technology. Uh, that's awesome. And, and this was in 2006, right? Mm -hmm. So... 2006, eight startups were not popular. As yeah. I remember in India, I was also an right. undergrad. Like yeah. no one was thinking of, thinking about these things, especially technology startups. Right. Um, uh, was there any turning point, any experience that made you uh, more inclined towards this? Like, were as a child, were you already doing businesses when you were in high school in Jabalpur, yeah. <laughs> or uh, because because of coming to IIT Bombay, you once you got exposed, it just opened your mind to a whole new set of possibilities. Yeah, I mean, my dad is also an engineer and he works uh, for the government, so I didn't really have a business background. I didn't do any of those things. It was largely influenced by the ecosystem at IIT Bombay, uh, which made a huge difference to to us. And and I think once we started getting feedback on, on what we were doing just made us feel like there's so much more that can be done as an entrepreneur and, and that's how we saw the chapter on the entire career. Awesome. And and how long did you do Hello Intern? So I worked on it throughout for from from 2006 to 2008. Uh, at that time we realized it was not really a large business but right. it was actually creating a lot of impact. So at that time I kind of stepped out of uh, that business and, and some of folks started focusing on other things. And were there any initial lessons that you learned, uh, this is about 13 years ago, uh, yeah. as you're building a company, whether it's about talking to customers, making assumptions, uh, yeah. maybe go-to-market strategy, or things like yeah. those that, that are, those words are pretty common now, yeah. but they may not be common. Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, we had no business background. Mm -hmm. We had no, not much guidance on like actually how to build a business. Uh, so we were just trying to figure out things ourselves and I feel like what we realized was we were trying to kind of like build a marketplace between companies and students mm -hmm. and now it's common knowledge that like building marketplaces is hard, right? You need to get right, either <laughs> supply or demand right. and without one you can't really get the other and that's a very obvious thing now. For us, second year you know, engineering students wasn't very clear so it took us a long time to actually build that, mm -hmm. right? We had to really... Like, so like hack our way through it. So we would reach out to recruiters and say, hey, you want to hire interns? And they would right. always say no, right? So it was like a challenge for us. And we spent like four months just trying to find postings on our right. website. Then we realized that that's not the right path because a lot of people in the recruiting world in India only wanted to take care of the full-time jobs. Right. So what I did was we started actually, we did, took a bold move and we started reaching out to the CEOs of the company. Mm. And started telling them like if you want to attract the best quality talent, you really need to go early and then acquire, right. like hire the best students up front. So we had folks from like Creative, uh, you know, a lot of other big companies in India, and also startups, uh, entrepreneurs who all came to us. Uh, like we reached out to them, and they all got back to us and said like, hey, it makes sense for us to hire interns. Right. We kind of like went like top down, which is very interesting because now. People talk about in enterprise sales that you should go top down. We didn't know that. Right. Like we just went to the CEOs and like they would say, "Hey, you know what? We'll uh, we'll give it a shot." And a lot of them just like hired one intern through us, and then it became like, "Oh, it was valuable," and they started hiring more and more through us. Yeah, and and I'm just trying to think of the context here. So, a there is no tribal knowledge as such mm -hmm. around uh, best strategies mm -hmm. to to sell to enterprises. Second, it's in India. Yeah. Third, it's in, uh, it, there is no internship culture now that I yeah. recall my time. It's not that companies are not yeah. clamoring to hire the best interns. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so, so you had to sort of take, sort of think five steps ahead and you were already doing, yeah. uh, what at that time, what people are doing now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and that, uh, uh, that kind of thinking is basically shows the, the forward thinking or innovativeness that uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think we we kind of like bumped into this problem. I feel like the whole thing is like I didn't realize in hindsight that mm-hmm. we are kind of ahead of it that time in right. India because I think there's an internship website in the US that became popular yeah. in yeah. like yeah. five yeah. years back, yeah. right? And we started that in India 13 years back. So I feel like we are kind of like a little bit ahead of the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, totally. No, uh, makes total sense. And that's why I was super interested in, in Hello Intern because I see uh, many companies doing that now yeah. and they may be successful now. Uh, yeah. But um, that is definitely no way to uh, Cool. So, so you did Hello Intern uh, for a while. Uh, and then you moved immediately uh, to the US. So, so how did that? Yeah, happen? so I spent a few years working before I moved to the States for business school. I also tried my hands at other startups. Mm-hmm. Some of them didn't really go anywhere. So I feel like I talk about these two, but there are four or five others. I tried okay. my hands on in education, in personal finance, mm-hmm. and for many different reasons, uh, they didn't work out. And I feel like that's the journey with most entrepreneurs go through, which we don't really talk about as much. But I, I had periods of frustration where I like would think about a business and like something could, would go wrong and we have to shut it down. So I worked on a few different ideas. Uh, I also worked in, in a strategy consulting firm for a short bit. Uh, then I started uh, with my co-founder Vinash, uh, a company called bookmycab.com, mm-hmm. which was like a website to book taxis. Back in like taxis Uber for <laughs> but much before all of yeah, that. Yes, we thought about that back in 2009 uh, and was like, Again, like way ahead of its time because there were smartphone penetration in India was like 4%, 4, 5%, mm. like very low, mm. right? 3G wasn't there, mm. right? It was mostly people were using like, yeah. you know, like 2G, right? So yeah. it's kind of like very early and the way you should book your taxi was actually call us and, and, and so like we will reroute you to the taxi. So like it was, like, yeah, like again, like an interesting idea, but kind of like before its time as well. And, and that's kind of fascinating to me now that you tell me you have done so many startups. So mm. you've always been looking for the next uh, interesting, innovative thing. And um, that's, that's I think, a quality that also helps in uh, venture capitalizing. Yeah, that's it. Uh, one question around startups is, like, see, so you had co-founders. Mm-hmm. How, did, how did you meet your co-founders? And how, how did you decide to start a company with them? Were they like best yeah. friends? And... Yeah, I mean, I think the at Hello, it's actually both cases it was like really good friends who I ended up starting a company with. So I, at that time, again, like there was like no formal process that I knew mm-hmm. how to find co-founders. I knew people, and and they were friends from ID Bombay. I really thought they had complementary skill sets, and they 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 were really driven as well. So I was like, okay, it's a good fit. We'll just work together and figure it out. Cool. Uh, so so you uh, graduated. You worked at strategy consulting firm mm-hmm. for some time. How did you decide uh, to come to Harvard? Why not go to IIM, for example? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good question. I'm at our great schools. Uh, I think what I realized were a couple of things. One is what drives me, mm-hmm. and what drives me is to be at the cutting edge of technology mm-hmm. at a global scale. Right? It's it's never. I want to be good, but not just good in India. I want to be good at that global scale, and that really mattered to me. The second is I realized that a lot of my ideas were also kind of like ahead of its time mm-hmm. in India. And I think the kind of things that I wanted to do, I felt like all of that was happening in, in the States at that time. Now, that may not be true completely right now. There are a lot of new innovative businesses around the world and we are seeing that happen at light speed as well. But at that time, it felt like you know, I would look at Discovery Channel as a kid and I'll see like everyone who's doing cool stuff is either at MIT or in Palo Alto. Right. Right. And I was like, you know, I want to be that person. I don't want to be... So I have this whole thing around, I don't like being in the audience, I want to be the performer. So I would not look at the show and say, hey, wow, that person is doing something awesome. It was like, why am I not doing it? Like, I mm-hmm. should be the one doing it. So for me, getting a global platform to enable myself to work in cutting edge technologies that will transform the world and not you know, one geography was extremely uh, inspiring and exciting and that's what I wanted to accomplish and I also realized that I care so I love technology but I think of technology as a tool mm-hmm. to solve problems mm-hmm. I think of it I think of myself as a as a kind of like a business soft problem solver mm-hmm. uh, using a lot of like cutting edge technology so I felt like during my time at Hello Intern, during my time at Book My Cap, there were a lot of other things I could have done better right. had I had formal education in, mm-hmm. in business. And I felt like if I have to do that, I think Harvard is a great place, right? Like that's where 
a lot of uh, you know theories around strategy, general management originated. A lot of high quality research and in management happens at Harvard. So for me, it was a great place to explore, uh, you know, studying and and actually building the foundation of uh, you know long term uh, business uh, skills. Uh, no, that's that's awesome. Uh, but coming to Harvard is also expensive. Mm-hmm. Right, so not not a lot of people can afford to come to Harvard, yeah. and uh, U.S. education is not that cheap, especially yeah. the the elite Ivy yeah. League yeah. schools. Um, so, so how did you sort yeah. of uh, take that leap of faith yeah. to spend so much money? Yeah, no, money? I think that's a very important question. Just you know, going back slightly, like when I was in Jabalpur in high mm-hmm. school. I wanted, I was preparing for IIT, but I used to look at people from MIT and like Stanford doing things. That's where I wanted to go. I wanted to be at the cutting edge. And, and I think I, I really lucked out that I got to got the chance to, to go to IIT for undergrad. But I feel like all the time I felt like, yes, I want to go there I, and I can get there. Mm-hmm. I just didn't know how to finance it because, you know, my dad used to work for the government and obviously we didn't have the resources to actually go out and, uh, you know, to pay for an expensive education. So I had no idea how to do that. And that's why U.S. education was not top of mind for the longest time. Mm. Uh, but I did have some of my seniors from IIT Bombay who went to HBS and Stanford. And I learned from them that, like, there's a pretty meaningful scholarship component and, and a pre-approved loans that Harvard and Stanford provides to students. Uh, so the, the thesis or the theory at Harvard is that, like, you know, if you are good enough to attend the school, mm-hmm. then no matter what your means are, we will find a way for you to, to actually fund it. Uh, and I think that to me, uh, appealed to me a lot. And I think that was one of the big reasons or big criteria that I had in terms of selecting a business school where mm-hmm. I can, my education can be financed because neither did I have the resources mm-hmm. nor I think uh, you know, you could get the loans of that amount right. uh, in India to actually support a Harvard education is around 200k in two years. Right? So it's so a, a lot huge of amount, right? That's for someone, yeah, like, so it was a big deal. But I think the good thing that was that I knew that that's not an issue at Harvard and that's why I chose Harvard as well. A good part and I, I got a pretty meaningful scholarship but also a big loan which was approved. Uh, you know, the day I got admitted and accepted mm. the offer. So I didn't have to go through the loan process, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and, and I think that has enabled so many people uh, to actually take an education at HBS. Yeah, uh, I, I assume I'm sure there are a lot of other people in mm-hmm. India who are probably highly ca- very capable, yeah. they are intelligent, they are hardworking, but they are not able to get the quality education uh, that they probably want because they are not able to find the means. Yeah, uh, exactly. So Harvard basically helped uh, significantly in that sense yeah. and that's amazing Absolutely. for Harvard yeah. to do. Otherwise, I, I don't think, I can't imagine myself mm-hmm. being able to like afford an education like this. Yeah, no, that's awesome and that's great for Harvard and that's why so many big uh, founders and CEOs and consultants and Harvard graduates are in every field yeah. uh, doing pretty yes. well. Yeah. Uh, Cool. So, so you had thought how Harvard and MIT are going to be uh, when you were in India. Mm-hmm. Did they live up to your expectations? How was it when you actually moved to Harvard? Yeah, like, I how think the experience? It, it actually did. It actually exceeded my expectation. I think the, the quality of education at HBS was just phenomenal. I think the professors at HBS are like really sort of invested in actually not just research, but also improving the bar, increasing the bar on, on education, right? And I think it was amazing, like, the amount of involvement that the school had and how much investment they made in actually helping you improve. Mm-hmm. No matter what your background is, it was phenomenal. Because think about at HBS, like, there are people from, like, I think, 60 plus countries and from various stages of life and, and on different industries, and they're all very different, right? Like, it was my first time, since the, like, when I joined Harvard, that was my first time I, I was in States, I've never been here. Do you have family, do you have friend, like strong So I have no family, okay. no extended family in, in the States when I moved here, right? Okay. So it was like a completely foreign land to me and I've right. never been here before. So I think for someone like me, and then there were people who went to Harvard undergrad <laughs> and, you know, worked in right. Boston and then joined HBS. So we are very different, coming very different entry points. And, and I think HBS did a phenomenal job of making us all feel at home mm-hmm. and, and, you know, empowered to learn and 
and grow. So I think that was an amazing experience. And uh, what do you, do you remember some of the uh, sort of things that took you by surprise when you were at Harvard? I've been, when I ask people, uh, one of the things they always say is like how smart everyone else is. And yeah. that makes you feel like you are not that smart. Yeah. Uh, but in, in terms of learning uh, yeah. new new things that you did not possibly probably expect. Yeah, I think one of the big things that I learned was not necessarily always academic, but also mm -hmm. like just more on the people skills side, mm -hmm. right? Like being an engineer uh, and focus mostly on the like hard skills, I think for for me, it was a great opportunity to learn and develop my softer sides of uh, softer skills, right? So just understanding you know, people dynamics, how do you actually build relationships with people who are very different from you? How do you relate to people who have a very different background and build bond with them? And mm -hmm. in the end, like become a good citizen in terms of like being helpful to everyone. So I think that softer aspect of it was extremely, extremely important. And then the other thing was that, you know, HBS taught me to think really, really big. Like, I mm -hmm. think they actually almost like, you know, like hammer it in you that like, hey, you know, you can be like a leader in, and there are people who went to the school that became big leaders in, at a global scale mm -hmm. and you can be one of those. So you need to start thinking big and, and, and making big moves in life. So I think that, that was pretty amazing. I feel like a lot of us are like very capable, but sometimes we just limit ourselves right. by how we think about things. Mm -hmm. And HBS like pushes you to actually think bigger. And I think that, that really helps a lot. Oh, that's that's awesome. So so they take the the most talented people from maybe the humblest of the backgrounds, they provide them resources and they make make them think big. They allow them to yeah. think big. I think there are people from all all sorts of places, right? There were there were some of my classmates were like, you know, sons and daughters of billionaires and right. some of okay. them were CEOs. So there were people from all across. But amazing thing was everyone was like just like very friendly and, right. and actually ready to learn together and that was right. that was great awesome uh so so you're, you you had a good two years at harvard you graduate and you go to linkedin yeah. uh, in product management mm -hmm. how did you sort of choose a product management and then maybe decide what type of company do you want to work at yeah. uh, and then also like uh, give us a sense of how you decided to work at Funbox because LinkedIn is is a uh, is a more social network and yeah. Funbox is more of a fintech company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think LinkedIn was and product manager was pretty straightforward for me. I am a builder and I think product manager's job is closest to like a business person can be to mm -hmm. being a builder. Uh, and, and so it's very entrepreneurial job. So that was very clear to me that product manager is the right discipline. LinkedIn because I wanted to manage products that I use every mm. day. And, and, and I, if you remember a few minutes back, I said like I reached out to a lot of CEOs right. uh, and asked them to hire, you know, Intello in 2006, 2007. Right, I right. did it on LinkedIn. Okay. So I joined LinkedIn. I was like one of the early folks from LinkedIn, on LinkedIn from India, right? So right. I think I used that and I've been using that product a lot and I got a chance to connect with a lot of high like senior individuals in India and abroad oh, through LinkedIn for many, many years. Uh, and I felt like that platform was so powerful mm. and it enabled me and opened so many doors for me that I felt like I really wanted to be a product manager or something like that. So I think it was a pretty straightforward decision for me. It's like, I love the product. I would love to like be a PM there. So I think that, that was the reason for LinkedIn and it was great. Like I had an amazing time learning from a lot of people. It was also a bigger company, so I learned kind of with the ropes of product management at LinkedIn from really good senior leaders and, and learned about how big organizations work because it was also my first time doing right. that. Uh, the other thing was it allowed me to be in the Bay Area where okay. all the activity, yeah. a lot of startup activity is. So that was why I joined LinkedIn. After close to three years at LinkedIn, I decided that I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. And mm -hmm. I think as a lot of companies have, like, it's not very straightforward to start a company when you're an H1. So, I think while I started thinking about, kept on thinking about different ideas, I felt like I still want to do something more entrepreneurial where I have control over what I'm doing. Uh, and I think for that, I wanted to join an earlier stage company. And, and I actually, a classmate of mine from ID Bombay was at Unbox and he told me about Shantan. I actually talked to him. So oh, nice. I, he's, I've already talked to, I've already interviewed him and his story is also very yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'll, so I'll tell you already later. But yeah, awesome. Yeah, so Shantan is a good friend and 
and he had joined Fun Boxing. He spoke highly of them, and I met with the team. It seemed like a phenomenal, so like it, very very interesting business there. And I I thought I would be a great place for me too. When when you joined Fun Box, how many people do you remember? I think it was forty forty five. Forty forty. So Fun Box is a very high growth company. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, yeah, I'll see your Fun Box is also an investor in stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nice. But, uh, yeah, so, EL is amazing. EL is, EL is amazing. I I always go to him for advice. Anything yeah. fintech related. Uh, Prashant is also an yeah. investor. Yeah. Uh, who's oh, a wow. chief product nice. officer. Prashant is yeah. Prashant is awesome. He's he's had such great experience yeah. leading products at Facebook yeah. and Google. Uh, I remember just as a side note, I remember meeting him, and this is after the investment, and we were thinking about product. We had like one forty five minute meeting, and he just. Gave us so many insights. I remember scribbling like three pages of notes <laughs> in my notebook. Yeah. Uh, so, so Prashant uh, has been super helpful. But <clears throat> so there were forty-five people at Funbox when you joined. Mm -hmm. um, how did the team increase, and how did your uh, sort of role change? I'm, I'm assuming so, you had more responsibility. Yeah, so I was there to lead a new product line for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, as in any startup, you wear multiple hats, and you you solve whatever needs to be solved. So I was working on multiple different projects at the yeah. same time, setting up teams, you know, there was a high, you were hiring more engineers in the team, I think designers and so on. So it's like pretty much like any startup has. Uh, yeah, so it, it was a great experience, but I was there for like a short period. Oh, sure. Year. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Fundbox also has team in Israel, yeah. I think. Did you work with the Israel yeah, team? And I the, the reason I'm asking is because I want to know your thoughts on working with remote teams. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a big trend yeah. uh, nowadays. Yeah. So, uh, how was working with with a team that was 12, 10 hours? Yeah, uh, I had a few. Yeah, it, it is challenging, but I think what I can tell you after two years in venture is almost every company now has a remote presence mm -hmm. or or multiple offices or a distributed team. Mm -hmm. Just need of the hour, like the area is getting extremely expensive, right. but not just expensive. Actually, getting extremely hard to hire, mm. uh, you know, high quality people in the Bay Area, and, and there are the talents everywhere, right? So you really, I've seen like more and more companies have offices around the world, like companies' offices in Argentina, like Poland, mm. India, China, of course, Israel, where you can hire more people and retain them for a lot longer. Uh, and I think that I think it's a it's the reality of our current times, right? right. And you have to work with remote teams. It is challenging, but lots of collaboration tools now which makes it somewhat easier but it's still involved like late nights and early mornings and uh, it is what it is but the good thing is like the team in Israel was really strong and mm -hmm. people remained in the company for a long long time so they were really sort of like very loyal the creation rates are really low and that enabled us to, to actually get a lot accomplished with yeah, I, I have a feeling there's going to be fun box mafia soon. Shannon has already started one company, yeah. and I feel like uh, uh, others would also <laughs> uh, soon start with us. Yeah. Um, so, so you uh, you worked at Funbox and then you came to Lightspeed directly right. after that. How did how did you decide to make that transition, and uh, why did you decide to make that transition? Yeah, so that's a that's an important question. I feel like. Moving from operating to venture is a pretty big decision, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the way I got to, I wasn't really actively looking to move to venture. Uh, I knew Nakul Mandar was also a partner at Lightspeed for many mm -hmm. years, and he reached out to me and said, "Like you should, you should explore talking to us and see if there is a fit for for you to join Lightspeed." And at that time, I was like, "You know, I seems like an interesting place," and I had a chance to talk to uh, the partnership at Lightspeed, and I was amazed by. You know, like the work ethic there, and, mm -hmm. and then, you know the hunger and desire to actually succeed. And mm -hmm. uh, we talked to some of our portfolio companies, and everyone spoke very highly of the firm. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, look, if I want to go to venture, I think this is a place, and now is the time because getting to venture is hard. Uh, in general, it's really tough. Uh, it's even harder for someone like us, right? Where we're really? not like from the Bay Area, we don't really have any natural networks to begin with. Uh, so it's just a hard, harder, uh, so super hard to get in. So for us, for me, it was very important to actually figure out that venture is what I want to do. Because if I did, this was a great opportunity, mm -hmm. like probably as good as it gets. And mm -hmm. and I, I spent time talking to a lot of my other investor friends and I spent time thinking about it. And I realized that, look, I love working with startups. 
I love working in cutting edge of technology and venture gives me the opportunity to actually work with a lot of high quality cutting edge technology companies at the same time mm. and play a small role um, in their success. And I feel like that to me, as I thought more about it, was very, very satisfying. Uh, and, and that's how I make decisions. It's not as much about money or success, it's about do I feel excited about the day to day? Because that's what matters, right? If you're spending like 50, 60, 70 hours a week doing something, you yeah. better enjoy doing it. You feel satisfied doing it. You can't, nothing else can you know, like match up for it. So for yeah. me, it was extremely important. And I, the more I spent time, the more I thought about that, it felt that like, yes, this is what I want to do. And, and I decided to, to, to join Lightspeed. Yeah. Uh, just, I, I actually remember this. Uh, after you joined Lightspeed, I think I met you for coffee a yeah. few months after that and you're like, dude, I haven't worked this hard <laughs> in my life. Yeah. And you had been to IIT, you had been to Harvard, you had done other things and, and your first comment was, uh, it's it's a pretty tough job. Yeah. Um, requires, so you need to be super interested uh, like internally to do this, otherwise you have to survive. be extremely driven, right? Because it's highly ambiguous. Uh, Nobody is watching behind your back. Like, right. Nobody is looking at, oh, are you doing your job or not? You have to be extremely self-driven. You need to figure out your way to get in front mm. of the right companies, help them, and, and actually build a uh, reputation uh, such that people want to work for you because it, it's a tough industry, right? Like entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs have a lot of choices. And I right. think in the end, uh, you know, for you to be picked as a trusted partner that the entrepreneur would want to work with the long term is not that easy. And I think uh, so that's a, it's a very, very hard job. It's a lot harder than I ever thought. Uh, it's also very, very satisfying, as I mentioned, so it's totally worth it. Uh, awesome. The second thing you mentioned mm -hmm. that I want to touch upon mm -hmm. is building networks. Mm -hmm. uh, so you said you knew Knuckle for a really long time and you had never sort of considered going into venture. How do you uh, think about building networks? Someone coming from outside the U.S. Uh, yeah. doesn't have a natural network mm -hmm. in the in, in the U.S. through undergrad or through uh, other channels like family, friends, and, and whatnot. So as people think about moving to the U.S., whether it's venture, whether it's startup, or tech, or anything else, yeah. do you have any thoughts on how people should think about like, building a network? Yeah, so I think, and this may not be a very popular opinion, I don't think you should build a network. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it feels to me that that's a very transactional way of approaching mm -hmm. things. I'm an introvert, so I am mm -hmm. not like someone who's like trying to get to know a 200 people. <laughs> it just doesn't come naturally to me. I'm right. all about like finding a few people that I connect very well with mm -hmm. and just building a good relationship with them. And mm -hmm. I think that to me, that's what matters even now as an investor. It's like, well, I meet a lot of people, but it's about a few people that you really uh, get to know well and build deep relationships with and then it can just be helpful uh, to anyone and everyone you meet, right? In any small way. And I think to the extent that you do that, you you know, I think generally people are nice and uh, it's, you know, if you are a good person, you're adding value and, and you genuinely care about other people, I think it, it works out by, by itself. You don't really have to think about, oh, I need to build a network. It's just, I think the, the, if you start thinking that way, it becomes very transactional and it shows, right? Like I think right. like, nobody wants to like, connect with someone who's transactional. So yeah. I, I, my personal way was always like, when I met, meet with anyone, it was never mm -hmm. with an intention, oh, I will. When I met Nakul, it was not with an intention, oh, I want to get a job at my yeah. right? right? It was Nakul, it was like, yeah. you know, he was very smart, he was extremely driven. I loved my conversation and brainstorming different right. ideas with him and that was what I was looking for, right? And and I think it, everything else comes in. So I think it's it's a function of be generally curious about people, mm -hmm. be ready to help to the extent that you can and yeah, and that things take care of itself. I, I totally agree. I think building honest relationships with mm -hmm. people you like is highly underrated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in I today's agree. world. Um and, and uh, Generally, those are the people and those relationships help oh. in the long run. Yeah. I, I, so other side of the uh, uh, question or, or thought is if if you don't like, let's say we are not thinking about building network mentors uh, is is another thing that I think anyone who uh, is either in the venture or tech world uh, having mentors mm -hmm. just helps you 
improve faster in yeah. a way. And that's that's a super honest relationship with someone and yeah. that goes on for yeah. years. Yeah. Do you have any mentors? Did you find any mentors? Do you consider people, uh, some yeah. people as your mentors? And how did that come about? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's actually a very important point. I never understood the importance of it in mm. a few years back. And my first mentor is Prakram, who was also one of the senior PMs at, at LinkedIn. Prakram Kanku? Yeah. So he's, <laughs> yeah. He's, he's, he's just been very helpful as yeah. throughout my product journey yeah. because he was a few years ahead of me yeah. and would always advise uh, me on how to think about product management and that helped me a lot as I as I sort of went through my journey in product and I think I'm, for now in the venture space I think that could continues to be my mentor and he's he's a friend but also an important mentor he's been in the industry for much longer he's he's had a pretty amazing portfolio uh, and there's a lot of learnings I have so he's someone I reach out to all the time and to your point mentors can help accelerate your uh, growth uh, and I think that is like that. I think finding a mentor is an extremely important thing that right. everyone should do. I think. Yeah, and uh, is is there is there any specific thing you'll mention uh, in terms of who is a good mentor or who's not a good mentor or how sh- how you should think about having a mentor? It's like how yeah. deep of a relationship and yeah. stuff. Like yeah, that. I think it's hard for me to say because I haven't had a, uh, you know very many mentors. But I think what I would say is like find someone who has been on a similar journey mm-hmm. as you, but there are a few years ahead of you at least. Right. And I think that actually is a good thing. Like for example, like, fun. at yeah. some point, I would look up to like Prashant, for example, right. like similar journey it was ahead of me by like at least 10 years right. in, in product management, right? Parakram, like ahead of me five years. Yeah. Or, and, and that way is you actually know the choices they made and they yeah. feel that they should have think, done things differently. You can at least learn from that. So I, to me, that's generally the framework that I use, which is like, find someone who had a similar trajectory as you, but just five years ahead of you, yeah. and, and learn from that person. So that's how Nakul is very similar, Parakram is yeah. similar, as well as uh, uh, Prashant. But in the end, that's what fr- the framework I use. Mm-hmm. There may be many other flavors to it that that could work as well. Yeah, no, uh, totally. And the, the personal relationship and uh, understanding of your background is, is important. Yeah. And I think you need to find someone who's genuinely invested. Right. And I think it doesn't happen in first go, but I think you really need to do that. It can't be, again, like nothing, no relationship should be transactional. Right. It doesn't really result in anything great otherwise. So I think I have a very close relationship with PKI across the country. Right. I've learned a lot yeah. from that. I, I'm not sure if. Uh, PK introduced us. Uh, He's the one who introduced us. Uh, yeah, so uh, just as a side note on Parakram, mm-hmm. uh, I got intro to him uh, through his wife uh, oh, wow. uh, because uh, because of some reason I, I met her uh, somewhere. And uh, PK actually helped me think about Stilt yeah. and business a lot. Nice. And that's very early on uh, and he never like so, so one of those things like where uh, Parakram genuinely helped me uh, think about things mm-hmm. never never uh, sort of uh, asked for anything like the, the non-transactional part uh, and he uh, he was think he was trying to put himself in my shoes and then giving yeah. me advice and I'm like I haven't thought about it this way exactly. so, so Parakram uh, PK as, as he's called is is uh, is, is one of those people who's absolutely smart. I think he was like IIT ranked 30 or something yeah, and yeah. and uh, is uh, is very knowledgeable about product and, and also investing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, and uh, he's, as you said, he's very authentic in yeah. terms of helping people. And, and, yeah. you know, and that actually was very helpful. He, he introduced me to you, he introduced me to a lot of other people right. also who yeah, have awesome. been super helpful. Yeah, cool. Yeah, awesome. Uh, awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> In a Shanta movie in a PK, I, I didn't know that before. Yeah. Um, um, so so now you now you're at light speed and and you you are on this uh, uh, venture path. For 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 a lot of people who are still like very early in their journey, what what would you advise people uh, mm-hmm. if they are either thinking about coming to the Bay Area or getting mm-hmm. into tech or mm-hmm. getting into uh, into venture? Like some learnings that you've had along the way. I think that's somewhat broad as a question. Mm-hmm. If you're moving from India to the States, I think just generally doing a master's um, and building some tangible skill sets is definitely helpful. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's much much harder now with all the you know, situations to actually transition from India to right. states right away. So I think going for a master's, I mean, that's no surprise. It's, it's definitely a great way to do it. I do think there is a lot of value, as expensive as the valley is, mm. uh, there's a lot of value in actually yeah. spending time in the valley. It's just a different place. Right. Right? It's like nothing, it's like nothing else in the world. The energy it's is amazing. Different. The amount of like innovation, energy in this 30 mile radius from here is just phenomenal. I think if you've got to be in tech, I think there is value in spending a few years here at the very least, mm -hmm. just learning and absorbing from people around you and, and, and the ecosystem. So I think definitely I strongly recommend that a lot of times we make the decision based on, hey, it's very expensive to live in India. In San Francisco, I should live in some other city and save more money. But I think that's fine. You have to think really long term. Right. I think there's value, value in being here, building getting to know a lot of people because this is a concentration of very smart people is very, very high. So you get to know a lot of really smart and driven people in a very short period of time. I think it's a very valuable uh, thing to do. So I think strongly recommend that, even though it may seem like a costly proposition. Uh, I also think in, in terms of moving to tech, I when I joined LinkedIn, I was a little skeptical about joining a big company, being mm -hmm. an entrepreneur all, mm -hmm. all the while, but I feel like there's a lot of value joining a bigger company early on in your career mm -hmm. because you need to understand and learn how organizations function at scale. Mm -hmm. That's one. The second thing that's really valuable of joining, about joining a big company is there are processes and there are there are kind of like training, mm -hmm. kind of like in some sense that, that is available. So as a PM at LinkedIn, you can learn from like the director of product or or the VP of product, and there are formal ways within the organization where you can get mentorship and learnings from other senior leaders. And I think that kind of stuff you don't necessarily get in a startup. So it, there is value in actually spending a few years uh, in a big company before you venture into a startup. But at the same time, I would say, you know, if you are in tech, I think, you, you know, and you can afford it, you should definitely explore working for a startup, I think, mm -hmm. or starting a company if you can. I, I think that's. That's where the real excitement and upside comes from, and you really see the impact of your 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 work in a very very tangible way. So I feel like if you have to think about your tech career, an ideal path would be probably to start with working for a tech, bigger tech company, learning the ropes of mm -hmm. both the function as well as organization, and then transition into taking a lot higher risk uh, position in a startup and making a real impact and making money. Yourself doing that, uh, I think that's that's typically what I would recommend. I think venture capital is very different, uh, just because it's a very tiny industry and it's very tiny. very few people actually join venture funds. Yeah. And I I think you need to be very careful with venture funds you join because mm -hmm. some firms actually drive a lot of returns and a lot of them don't. And and I it's just you need to be careful about the firm you join and the people learn from. Uh, I think the three things that mattered to me when I thought about venture and Lightspeed was, am I working at a firm which has a strong track record and reputation? Mm -hmm. I think that matters a lot in this business. Am I working with a firm that has, uh, you know, that has people I can learn from uh, who have deep experiences consistently investing in high quality companies and Lightspeed is definitely. Third is that Am I working with a group of people who are invested in my development? Mm -hmm. Because I was not an experienced investor, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, there's a the job was also a large part of that is learning as right. well from other people. And right. and you know, venture capital can be a situation where everyone is like just doing their work and they're overwhelmed and nobody's like kind of kicking, nobody cares about your development. I think that's not a great place to be. Mm -hmm. And I felt like at light speed, a lot of folks in the leadership uh, were really, it felt like they were uh, you know, invested uh, in, in my development progress in the firm. And that has, you know, that has been true since I joined. And I think that's another thing because it's kind of like a business where you learn by apprenticeship, mm -hmm. right? So I think you need someone to be actually to coach you. And I think that was another thing that was extremely valuable. So you have to think through all these things and you think about all those and there are 100 other filters makes venture capital just like a very hard place to grow. Right. I think the best way to join venture capital firm is 
the venture capital firm wants you to join them versus <laughs> yeah. you want to join them. Yeah. And I think the best way to position yourself such that the venture firm wants you to join them is to either start a company and make it successful or join a high growth company mm-hmm. early on and make a substantial contribution to that. I think that's the most common. I think that that's the best way to Absolutely. join. Absolutely. But there are other ways and, and you know there are journalists who became successful venture capitalists, lawyers Absolutely. that became kind yeah. of venture capitalists. So I think people move to this industry. So by no means that's the only recipe. If you feel very strongly about it, you should go for it. Yeah. Uh, but I think the most sort of like I think in my mind, I think the best path is probably that. No, uh, t- makes that's uh, absolutely true. That's uh, that's what's the most common uh, path that I have seen too, mm-hmm. um, and it's not an easy path. Yeah, <laughs> just just keep that in mind. It gets harder as you yeah. as you go in the industry. Right. Uh, now, time for my favorite question that I mm-hmm. What do you look for in founders and teams uh, before investing? Yeah, yeah. I think I believe in this simple principle that like. You, the gradient of your life is more important than your altitude. Mm-hmm. And by that, what I mean is how much have you progressed in life and not where you are right now. Because the rate of your progress or improvement determines where you can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I feel like I like entrepreneurs who have shown that, who have shown that they've, they've been able to improve themselves in many ways uh, in a very, very short time. They've grown very fast. And the Examples of that could be, you know, someone who came out of nowhere and, and built themselves somewhere or someone who grew within a company very, very fast or someone who actually, uh, you know, expert, established themselves an expert in a space very quickly. Mm-hmm. Someone who hustled their way into doing things, which does not seem very obvious to a lot of people, like people who can walk through walls, right? And that's the kind of people I feel like uh, make great founders. That's not the only kind. Uh, so that's something I really look for in founders, and you know, and you know it much much better than I do, which is like it's a hard job, right? And nine out of ten days you doubt yourself. Um, the one out of ten days when things go well, it's totally worth it. But you should have that, you know, persistence. You should have that so like hustle to actually go through those nine days to get to the tenth. Uh, and I think that's what we try to measure. The second thing is we also like. And particularly like founders who have a very product mindset. Hmm. Like gone are the days where you can just build a product and sell it to your customers mm-hmm. at the strength of your sales team. On the enterprise side, I think what you need is now is you need to have a strong sales team, but you also have to have a basic product that the users love, right? And I think we've seen a lot of companies that have this. So I feel like having a product mindset is extremely valuable in the founders. That's another thing I look for. The third thing is like a deep, unique technical insight. And that's mm-hmm. more relevant to my deep tech mm-hmm. sort of the portfolio, like computer vision, self driving cars, where why are you the right person to build this? Because you are in a very small subset of people who un- have a differentiated insight and an edge over others in terms of the development of the technology or, or, or sort of just a new last view of the technology. And those are the founders, those are the third set of founders. I, I, I look for and and you know anyone can be a combination of these three or anyone can be outside of that. I I've learned one thing that there is no rule, right? Mm-hmm. Like there are entrepreneurs who become very successful and they all look very different from each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think in the end it's about it's a lot more softer aspects of it, like getting to know the person, understanding their vision, drive, and making a decision. And that's what makes venture capital such a hard business because it's just there's no formula. But if I have to pick those three. Yeah, no, uh, awesome. So uh, thanks for talking to us. I think thanks a lot for inviting me. Yeah, uh, uh, it was one of one of my favorite interviews. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks, All right, thank you. Thank you.